How's everyone doing? Anyone need a bathroom break? Good. All right. Let's continue. Uh, Mr. Smestad, who's next? So our next witness was one of the head doctors who treated the injuries of the supposed victims in this case. And it seems that the reason the prosecution brought him in was to just go over how serious the injuries were. And I believe the injuries were quite bad. No one's arguing against that. In fact, it turns out that the disemboweled guy's heart stopped for several minutes while he was on the way to the hospital. That kid is lucky to be alive. But like I said, the testimony is just about the seriousness of the injuries, and the prosecution goes over it in grueling details. But we're not here to determine how bad the injuries were. The decision is whether or not this was self-defense. So we'll be skipping over this testimony, except for this short clip, which shows Chirophacy asking some pretty important questions. Can the, can the trajectory of the injury, meaning what it ends up looking like, change based upon what the person who's being injured does. Do you understand my question? Well, sure. I mean, penetrating trauma is all about what the trajectory of your in, of the object doing the injuring does, and our job is to figure out what that trajectory is. So if someone moves as the penetrating object is going through them, mm -hmm. that would change the trajectory and what the injuries would be. Right, fair enough. So if, for example, I stab you, and what, when I stabbed you, you were shoving me and, and actually knocking me backwards off my feet, okay? That could change, like, my arm angle and what ends up happening to you as a result of that. Is that fair? It's a dynamic process, so the two would be uh, affecting each other for sure. Sure. So uh, something that looks like a stab wound that's going straight, right, that's kind of going in, that might not certainly have the same impact of taking an injury from your navel area up to your chest area as it would be if that same penetrating wound happened and the person got shoved and the knife got moved. Is that fair? It would, although I would worry at AJ he would have had a worse injury if it went deeper and it didn't go up. So you're saying if the force is that someone gets pushed and instead of the knife going straight mm -hmm. it comes up in his case that would have actually been a better thing because his deepest injury was that lowest part and if that knife went deeper it would have had a bigger injury and he probably would have never made it to the hospital okay but in terms of what you know the jury has seen this photo of his abdomen area i guess i just want to make sure that i understand um for example riley suffered a puncture, if that's fair, a puncture wound, her abdomen or her side here didn't open up like that, right? It was wide open. It just wasn't as large. Right. Understood. And that could be, meaning that what it looks like, I think you've said this, could be based upon what the person's body is doing when the injury is occurring. Is that fair? Generally, yes. Okay. And... Does it also change in terms of the, the possible um, penetration of the wound? If I'm standing still and you stab me, okay, versus if I'm running at you and then you stab me, could that have an impact on the, the force used in the depth of the wound? It could. And it would make, it seems logical to me, but you tell me if this is right. If I'm running at you and I'm a grown person and I'm running at you with some force, it certainly is possible that the wound could go deeper because of the force that I'm providing. Is that fair? Sure. Okay. So then Anderson's only rebuttal to those questions was this. As far as what people's movements contributed, you don't know, you can speculate or say it could affect it, but that, is that the extent of what you're able to say? Correct. I mean, physics is physics, and, and it's a very dynamic thing, and movement of two objects that are interacting is going to lead to different outcomes. Let's not forget that Captain Stabin over here didn't even have the knife in his hand when AJ came charging at him. He quickly picks the knife up, gets on his feet, and stabs AJ in the belly as he's charging at Mew. 
So he indeed made that initial stab much worse by charging at Mew. Then by pushing Mew backwards, he caused Mew's arms to go backwards and upwards, which is how AJ became the disemboweled guy. So then the prosecution brought in Detective Sally Standart, who was in charge of collecting some of the DNA samples. And once again, this just seems like a waste of time and money. We have a video and we know who stabbed these kids. DNA analyses can't test for self-defense. So moving on, this is Ashley Hoffman. She's the forensic nurse examiner and she examined Nikolai Mew. She went over the small cuts that she found on his hands and the scrapes and nicks that he had on his back. And the overall sentiment of this testimony seems to be Nikolai Mew didn't have very many injuries. So he must have been the aggressor. Yeah, I don't think that proves anything other than Mew did a fabulous job defending himself. Just imagine what would have happened to him if he hadn't had the knife that day. And this testimony lasted way too long because we've already seen close-up pictures of his hands and I already cut all that out as well. Because once again, the question is not, did Nick Mew do this? The question is why? So moving on again. Thank you, Ms. Hoffman. You are finished. You may step down. Thank you. Mr. Smestad, who's the next witness? I think we're going to be swapping positions here. George, can you give us a minute? So then the prosecutors call the lead investigator on this case. We call uh, investigator John Schultz. Investigator, please stand. Raise your right hand and be sworn. He's the guy who's been sitting at their table the entire trial. I do. Please have a seat in the witness chair, Mr. Anderson. Can you please state your first and last name and spell your last name? It's John Schiltz, last name spelling S-H-I-L-T-S. And how are you employed? I'm an investigator with the St. Croix County Sheriff's Office. Again, uh, specifically to investigations, I have uh, attended numerous uh, courses geared towards investigators and detectives. And are you trained in doing digital, processing digital evidence? I am. What other roles have you held at St. Croix County Sheriff's mm -hmm. Office? I started in the jail as a corrections deputy. Uh, then I was, went to field services where I was a patrol deputy. Uh, some of the extra activities or, or specialized activities that I've been in um, include canine, honor guard, dive team, um, an operator for our ERU team, crisis negotiator, to name a few. How did you end up as the lead investigator? We have on-call weekends, and I was on call that weekend. Did you respond to the scene at the Sunrise Bridge? I did. When you were there, did you make contact with some of the witnesses who have testified? I did. As far as witnesses that have testified, I spoke with uh, Owen Peliquin, Ryan Nelson, Alex Fang, Madison Cohen, Janelle Duxbury, Quentin Carlson, and I believe that was it. And was that a in-depth interview or quickly gathering information? How was that? Uh, I was looking just for quick synopsis, name, date of birth, telephone number, and a, a synopsis. Were you trying to sort out who actually saw things and who were just bystanders? I was. When you made contact with Owen Pelican, Alex Vane, and Ryan, Alex Vang and Ryan Nelson, they were with Isaac's group? They were. Did you notice any signs of intoxication when you spoke with them? I did not. Were they, did you notice any slurred speech? I did not. Any swaying while they were standing? No, sir. And that was on body cam when you were interacting with them? It was, yes. Well, you know what they say. Nothing sobers you up quite like witnessing a stabbing. Did you get blood or breath samples for BAC for the witnesses you spoke with? I did not. Why not? I had no clues of impairment for any of them. Did law enforcement ever show witnesses the video of the incident prior to interviews? No. Did you do, did you do any more interviews that day? I did. And where were th those done? At Regions Hospital. And who'd you speak with there? At Regions, I spoke with uh, Quentin Carlson again, Anthony Carlson, Tony Carlson, he goes by, um, Dante Carlson, I believe that was it that day. I attempted to talk to Riley and AJ, but I couldn't because of their conditions. As part of the investigation, did law enforcement search the river for evidence? We did. Including actually in the water? 
Correct. How was that done? Uh, we utilized our dive team uh, who came over and searched that area. They, did, they, did that include metal detectors? It did. Did they find any knives? They did, yes. And can you describe those? I can. Uh, one was a corroded box cutter and another was a corroded uh, pocket knife. And when you say corroded, do you mean it looked like they've been in the water for a while? Yes, sir. Part of what you got is the video from Juwan, and then you got individual frames of that video, right? I did, yes. And so, so were you able to, by looking at the total frames compared to the total length of the video, figure out the frames per second for that video? Yes, it is 24 frames per second on average. I want to ask you about Larian Davis. So when, did you make contact with him on scene of the river? I did, yes. And did you, did he mention something about having a video? He did. And did you get that video from him? I did, yes. And how did that happen? I asked him to email it to me and he thought it was going to be too big, so he texted it to me. And did you see it come through in your text? I did. Did you, and you, you were here when it was played in court, that video? Yes. And is that the video, is that how you received it? I believe so. And did you notice right away that it was all blurry? I did, after I started to review it, yes I did. But right away when he sent it to you, did you notice? I did not, no. Did you, Follow up. Did law enforcement follow up with Larian to try to get the original? We did, yes. And what, what was done to try to get the original unblurred or version? Uh, it was sent. Well, first we recovered his phone. Is that what you're asking? I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, first we recovered his phone. Uh, we learned that Larian's phone had water damage uh, and that it was sent to an Apple facility in Indiana. We acquired a search warrant to obtain that. We did get that. I got the phone back. Uh, part of my duties, I do extractions on electronics to include cell phones. And I was not able to uh, get, a, get an extraction from his device. Uh, because I couldn't do that, we also utilized other method, methods, including search warrants to his cell phone provider, uh, Snapchat, as well as iCloud in an attempt to get that video. Were you ever able to get the original video? We were not. And did you do anything um, to see if you could try to get the video enhanced or cleaned up so it would go from distorted to more like how a normal video would look on a, from a cell phone? Yes, sir. What was that? I was sent to MOCIC, which is, uh, I believe it's Mid-States Organized Crime Information Center. Uh, they offer a lot of resources to a number of law enforcement agencies. Um, they have a lot more resources than, than most agencies can afford. Uh, one of those things that they can do is assist law enforcement with videos, photographs, things of that nature. Uh, so I sent it to them. And did you get back uh, another version of the video? I did. Did it look like a normal cell phone video? No. Still, still blurry? Correct. Was MO, and what was the acronym you used? MOCIC. MOCIC, is that also who did the frames for you? It is. Investigator Schultz, so this bottom one, is that the, would that be the original video you got from uh, Larry and Davis? Yes, sir. Okay, I'm just gonna open it up, Judge, and just go through a few frames so the jury can see the comparison yes. and this resized one is the one you got from MOCIC? Correct. Was there anything, were there any items that were turned in as found from civilians that uh, turned out to have some connection to the case? Yes, there was. Was one of those a cell phone? Yes. And were you able to determine the owner of the cell phone? I was. Uh, when I received the Cell phone, again, part of my job is doing cell phone extractions. Um, I took the SIM card out of the phone and recognized it, recognized it as belonging to T-Mobile. 
Uh, so I contacted T-Mobile, provided them with identifying numbers on that SIM card, and I learned the phone belonged to Ariel. And was another item that was turned in a pocket knife? Yes. And can you just, what brand pocket knife was it? Tactical Gears. And was, was there somebody that was interviewed that described having lost a Tactical Gears knife on that day on the river? Yes, Mr. Baldozo, I believe is how you pronounce his last name. Would that be the husband of the nurse, Andrea, who testified? It would be, yes. Are you aware that there was, that Nikolai said in his interview that one of the boys had a kitchen knife? I am. And was a kitchen knife located? Yes. Where was that located? At the hideaway. Was it discussed over the radio? It was. Was Nikolai in custody at that time? Yes. And were the officers around him wearing radios? They were. Was there a radio in the squad car when he got placed in a squad car? Yes. So I want to talk a little bit about Madison Cohen. You were, were you, I think you said you, Madison Cohen is one of the ones you made brief contact with on the, at the scene? Yes. Do you recall seeing any injury on Madison Cohen? I did not. Were you present for her testimony that when she said the sheriff's office told her that the sheriff's office didn't want a photo of her injuries? I was. Is that true? No. And did you, had you actually previously made efforts to retrieve the photo that she said she took? Yes. What was that? I did an extraction. I did not do the extraction. I reviewed an extraction from Madison Cohen's uh, cellu cellular device. Uh, I also did an extraction and reviewed it on Madison Cohen's mother's device. Why'd you do her mother's phone also? I spoke with, or I learned that Madison um, was not sure if she took the photo or if her mother took the photo. Uh, so both provided their cell phones so law enforcement could search them for the photos. And did you locate um, any photos during the time frame she said she thought she took it that could have been, or that was consistent with her description? Not during the time frame, no. Were there any deleted photos recovered from either phone? They were not. And the, when you do a download, why don't you just explain to the jury how you do a forensic download on a phone? Sure. Uh, so a phone in particular, I'll get the device. Uh, there's a lot of different variables, but I'll summarize. Uh, we pay for, for software, and I can plug the phone into a box, which goes into our computer which more or less um, copies the data on the device and then puts it into a, a readable format um, that's user-friendly so we can review the data. Uh, it's not uncommon that we don't always get everything, um, and really there's no rhyme or reason. Even the trainers, when I'm going through all these courses, say sometimes they don't know why we get X and sometimes why we, why we do. Um, just electronics or electronics, sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. When you do a forensic download, is, and including with Madison's phone and her mother's phone, that includes everything the download's able to pull off the phone? Correct. So photos, texts, calls, all those things? Yes. And so you testified Sheriff's Office didn't tell her you didn't want the photos. Were you present for a meeting at the DA's office with Maddie when the phones were, the photos were discussed? I was. And what was, what was Madison, well, did she express some anxiety about deleting the photos? She did, yes. And was there an effort to console her? Yes. And what was said to her? Um, not to worry about the photos. So she wasn't told you didn't want them, she was told not to worry about it? Correct. And that was after you'd already made all these efforts to get the phone that she consented to? Yes, well after. So you were, you're the court officer, so you've been present for the trial? Yes, sir. So for the next several minutes, they start talking about how the forensic map was made that shows where all the points of action took place in the river. 
And they start talking about how deep the river is or how shallow the river is. And at the end of the day, I just don't care. If I watch the same video of these stabbings, but it took place in a gas station parking lot at nighttime, the outcome would be the same and my opinion would be the same. So we're just going to skip all this and go straight to Chirophacy. I don't have anything else. Is there a Chirophacy? <clears throat> um, investigator Schultz, have you had, being the lead investigator in this case, does every report, every interview, everything ultimately work its way across your desk? No, sir. Okay. So you don't, if this is fair, you don't see some of the work that other people are doing in the case. Is that right? Correct. Okay. In terms of your background, you are or have been uh, involved in the crisis negotiation team? Yes, sir. Okay, the, the, and the SWAT team, right? Yes, sir. Would it be fair if I said to you, those are situations uh, in your experience, your training and experience, that sometimes involve high, highly stressful events? Correct. You were asked a couple of questions regarding uh, the knives or that were located in the river. Yes, sir. I do. And then you had mentioned that a civilian, I think you mentioned, a civilian had located a knife um, that had belonged to a Robert Beldozo. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Do you know when that knife, because Mr. Beldozo lost the knife, to be fair, on that day, right, on the 30th? Yes. He lost it in the river going to that scene. Is that right? I don't believe so, sir. You don't believe that he had pulled his knife out and was running over to the scene and then fell and dropped it? I, I've watched a lot of the body care, and I'm not trying to be argumentative. Um, I, I think he said at one point he thought he pulled it out, but in the body camera footage, you can actually see it clipped like in the back of his swim trunks. Um, so I'm not sure when it was lost. I apologize. No, but it, he's saying it was lost on that day, right? Yes, sir. Going to or as he's moving toward that incident, right? I believe he said he wasn't sure when he lost it. Okay. If, if there's a report, I could review it, but. Oh, that's okay. You also mentioned that in your, I guess, training and experience, these, these clips and videos that we're watching, just so I understand it, when we go through these stills, 24 of those consecutive stills equals one second in time. Is that fair? Yes. All right. And I want to ask you some questions about uh, your duties or your responsibilities on the 30th of July. Yes, sir. You're, and on the 30th of July, you're wearing, as this is going on and you arrive on the scene, you're wearing a body camera. True? Yes. You make contact with, I think you said, I'm not saying in which order, but you make contact with Owen Poliquin, Ryan Nelson, and Alex Vang, right? Correct. Okay. Do they ever mention to you that they have information that he was looking for little girls, Mr. Mew? I do not believe they did. Okay. You then have contact with Ms. Cohen, is that right? Correct. And you had contact with her, I think, two times, maybe briefly, but two times, right? I believe that's correct, yes, sir. Okay. And she's providing you some information as to what had happened, right? Correct. And how long, I don't know if I heard this, how long have you been an officer? Uh, I don't recall the exact dates. I've been employed by St. Croix County for 16 years this month. Uh, three of that was in dispatch, three was in the jail, the rest field services. Okay, so with what you know at that point about what's going on, you're, you're looking at Madison Cohen as you're talking to her, right? Yes. Okay. Having been a law enforcement officer for the length of time that you have, if you had noticed something on her face which was consistent with what she was telling you, would you note that? Yes. Okay, so if I said to you, investigator Schultz, I got 
somebody punched me in the face. If I had physical injuries that were consistent with that, you'd write that down, right? Yes. Okay. Would you, in some situations, photograph that? <clears throat> yes. Okay. You don't see on either one of your contacts with her on that day anything on her face that supports the claim that she was punched, correct? Correct. Do you remember her, her testimony saying that uh, it was her eye was puffy. Do you remember that? Vaguely, I believe. Yes. Okay. You didn't see that, did you? No. Do you remember? She also mentioned that the next day she had like some uh, yellow, almost like bruising. Do you remember that? I'm sorry, I don't remember her saying that. If you're telling me she did, I believe you. No, she says any bruise. The question was any bruise. She said a little yellow. Okay. Yes, sir. Um, do you say to people in this particular case, do you say to Ms. Cohen, look, if something shows up later, if a physical injury shows up later, capture that for us. We'd like that. I don't recall what all I said, sir. Okay. But was that something that you might do in these type of cases where a physical injury may appear later? Yes. Okay. And at some point, there is an attempt to get a photograph or an alleged photograph off of her phone. Right? Correct. Okay. And can you tell me this? You are a forensic examiner of cell phones. Correct. All right. And you didn't do the extraction on her phone, but you reviewed it, right? Correct. Okay. And can you tell me, there's, is there a difference in when you do these extractions between allocated and unallocated space? Yes. Unallocated is just uh, like deleted space. Okay, so if I'm on my phone looking at some website or some video or something, and I click off that, does that go into unallocated space? It could be cached. I guess I'm not certain if it goes into unallocated or not. I apologize. Is it, in your experience, your training and experience, is it more difficult to locate things in allocated or unallocated space? It's easier to locate if it's not deleted, yes. Okay. What you, the reason you do these downloads sometimes in law enforcement is you're looking specifically in some situations for things people delete off of their phones, right? Yes. Okay. And you can get a bunch of stuff sometimes off of deleted images or videos or text messages, things like that, right? Generally speaking, yes. Yeah. Okay. In your review of what you saw on the document review of Madison Cohen. There's no photograph recovered, correct? We know that. Correct, during that time frame when she said it was take, taken, correct. And there's nothing in that document review or that report that indicates that there was a photo that had been deleted either, right? Correct, there showed no deleted photos on either examination of Madison Cohen or her mother's phone. And I think Madison, I don't disagree with what you're saying, I think Madison also had said that she might have actually texted that picture to her mother. Do you remember that? Yes, or vice versa. Okay. Um, and that's the reason that you want to look at mom's phone is to see, well, there could be this text that went through. So even if Madison deleted it, we can get it from mom, right? And there was... Um, I'm I don't have the right word. Uh, neither was certain which one took it either. So we weren't sure if mom took it or Madison took it. But yes, that was part of it as well. Okay. And you do the forensic examination for Madison Cohen's mother's phone? Correct. Okay. <clears throat> and if I word this incorrectly, let me know. Yes, sir. No photograph that was in her, well, I'm going to say like saved images, right? Yes. Okay, so I have photos on my phone of my children and things like that. Yes, sir. Nothing in that area that you could just access by kind of swiping through, right? Nothing I'm sorry, I don't understand. To Madison's picture oh, of her face. correct, yes. And nothing in her deleted images which would support the claim that either she took the photo or Madison sent her the photo, correct? Correct. Okay, 
So I know that you said in some situations, sometimes we just don't get images, right? Yes. But that would have to happen in both of these cases then, right? Yes. You agree that you would never say, or you didn't say to Madison Cohen, I don't need that photo, it doesn't matter. Right? Correct. Okay, you would, in a case like this, Can you I? guys, when I say you guys, law enforcement, you wanted every piece of evidence you could get, right? I can, and can I correct myself in my last one or just clarify? Um, if she told me she had a photo, yes, I would want that. Um, maybe being empathetic and saying it's okay, don't worry about it, yes. But no, if, if there was a photo, yes, we would want it. Sure. So when she said, I told them I have a photo, and they said, don't worry about it, that's not something you would say, right? Like, well, we did worry say don't it. worry about it, but we didn't say that we did not want it, if that's what you're asking. I'm, I'm sorry. Right. No, you would, in a homicide case, you would want all the information that you could possibly get your hands on, right? Correct, yes, sir. I'm sorry, I misunderstood you. No, you're good. Um, did you ever, and I don't know if this is possible, this M-O-C-I-C? -C, yes. Do they have the ability to get information off of phones that you don't? I asked them, uh, and they, actually this is where I learned, uh, it got compressed. I didn't know that that could happen. And they said, there's nothing else that they can do besides the resize of the video. I, I, I'm, I'm so no, get... no, they couldn't do anything more than I did. Okay, so as it relates to looking for the information on Madison and Madison's mother's phone, yes. you giving that to this, uh, this organization that has more resources, that wouldn't have been useful? I'm just asking. I don't know if they take phones. They might. Um, I assume that they use the same Celebrite and or Axiom, Magnet Axiom that we use, um, but I don't know, sir. Okay. You were asked questions about when you saw Owen, Ryan, and Alex, if you um, ever tested their alcohol level or asked for a test. Do you remember that? I do. Okay. And you've heard, for example, Owen testify that he had he was drinking beer and doing shots of alcohol and using marijuana, right? Correct. Okay. You would agree drinking and using drugs may have a pers may impact a person's ability to accurately perceive what's going on, right? Yes. Okay. And it can also impact their ability to just recall it too, right? It can. Okay. And you know or you've heard by sitting at trial, all of these people admit that they had been drinking. Some admit they've been drinking and using uh, marijuana, right? I believe with the exception of Sheena, I think she said she was not drinking. I'm sorry, I meant the boys. Oh, sorry, yes. Do you know what Isaac Schumann's alcohol concentration was? I don't recall. Uh, I can estimate, um, but I don't recall exactly what it was. You know that he was legally intoxicated, right? Yes. Okay, and you know that he was well above the legal limit, right? Yes. Okay. Would it be helpful for you to know if those boys were also above the legal limit and highly intoxicated when you took those statements? It could be, as we talked about earlier, it could have an impact on what they said. If those boys would have said to you, that Mr. Mew was looking for little girls, would you have noted that somewhere? Yes. Okay, because we throw this word around, you've heard this word pedophile thrown around over and over. You take that seriously, right? Yes, uh, the majority of the crimes I investigate involve crimes against children. Right, so if, if somebody says to you, investigator, this guy's talking about looking for little kids based on your background, You'd be interested in that, right? Yes. Okay. And you'd agree, nowhere in any report that you prepared, do you document or indicate that they ever mentioned to you that he was looking for little girls? True? I'm not trying to be argumentative again. Uh, them specifically, no, but other people told me that they said that, so I documented it in my reports. But the boys specifically, no, sir. Right. Well, you've heard the testimony in this case. You heard Owen Pelequin today said that Mr. You told him that, right? Yes. Owen Pelican never told you that, right? Correct. Okay. 
So can you tell me, based on your training and experience, uh, both as a hostage kind of negotiator and as a SWAT team, member of the SWAT team, um, would you consider what happened here to be a highly stressful event? Yes. Okay. And your training and experience, if this is fair, tells you that people react differently in highly stressful events. Is that fair? Correct. Okay. Have you been... You sounds like you have been in multiple times in your professional life in highly stressful events. Correct. Okay. And you might react differently than another officer might react, right? Correct. Okay. And in these highly stressful events, have you, uh, through your training and experience, seen situations where people's bodies react to the highly stressful event? Do you know what I mean by that? No, sorry. Okay. Do you know or have, has it been your experience that sometimes people might, as you've heard, go white, where their body reacts to a highly stressful event? Have you seen people go pale in highly stressful events? I'm sure I have. I can't recall, but I'm sure I have. Have you seen them uh, become quiet, kind of almost catatonic? Again, I'm sure I have. I just can't think of a specific time. Wide-eyed? Yes. Okay. And does your training and experience tell you that those are things that their, that their body is just doing, right? Their body is getting wide-eyed or they're getting white or things like that, right? Yes. Okay. I, I'm sorry. I don't know that I understand it all the way. Don't apologize, investigator. Okay. You're doing fine. Um... Can I ask you, you were asked some questions about um, the river and the depths of the river and things like that. Correct. Okay. Now, you would agree, to be fair, you can, you can drown in calf-deep water, right? Potentially, yes. Right. So, especially if you get knocked unconscious, it, you can drown in six inches of water, right? I would suspect so, yes. I mean, I guess what I'm saying is you had talked about different areas of the river where you were kind of maybe up to your shoulders or up to your chest or up to your waist. You don't need to be in that deep of water if you're unconscious to drown. Correct. As a lead investigator, were you the officer who prepared the information for the crime lab regarding DNA on what was to be swabbed and where it was to be swabbed? No, sir. Okay. Do you know who did that? I don't, I'm sorry. I'm done, Judge. Thank you. Mr. Anderson. You're asked about um, deleted photos. When you did these forensic downloads of the phones, was it more common to find deleted photos or find or not find deleted photos? It's more common to not find the deleted photos than it is to find them. And you, you were asked about Roberto Baldazzo and um, his statement that he had thought he dropped it while r running up to aid um, some stabbing victims. Do you recall that question? I do. And you said that you saw a body cam of him with the knife in his shorts. Uh, what was he doing at that point in the body cam? Uh, providing aid to Isaac. And prior to July 30th, 2022, had you ever seen Madison Cohen before? No. So you didn't have any sort of frame of reference for what her cheeks or what she looked like before that? Correct. Can you, is the spot where it got deep, close to the bridge, visible on that image on the right? I'm sorry, I don't think I'm following. Can you, are you able, can you draw on your screen if the judge can enable it where that, where you call that deep spot being that was near to the bridge? Where it gets deeper, yes. Yeah. Right in that area there. Okay. I don't have any other, I don't have anything else. Mr. Trophacy? Do you ask Madison Cohen why she would possibly delete a photograph in a case like this? We did, yes. You did? Uh, but I, don't, I guess I don't know if we asked, but she made a statement that, uh, it was causing her anxiety. She didn't want to think about it. That's possibly why she deleted the photos. Okay. And in terms of what you observed when she came out of the water, um, 
you've heard in this courtroom far more detail about kind of how this went down than you did that day, right? Yes. I, right. So, I mean, you heard Madison Cohen get on the witness stand for however long and testify about what had occurred, right? Correct, yes. You've heard other people explain what they observed between Mr. Mew and Madison Cohen as well, correct? Yes. Okay. And so you've heard that this 248-pound man threw a hook, by some people's estimation, threw a hook to this girl's face and knocked her down, right? You've heard that. I think it's direct on relevance with this witness. I don't know what he can answer about what well, I mean, said. Well, overruled. I mean, it was said in court. Let's continue. You've heard that, right? Yes, some have said that. Okay. And you didn't see a single mark on her face based on that, did you? I did not see a mark on her face, no, sir. That's it, Judge Thanks. All right. Thank you, investigator. You can step down. It is 11.45. This is probably the best place to break for lunch. Uh, so we'll break a little bit early. Uh, we'll reconvene at 12.45. Please take the jury out. All right. So if you stayed awake through that whole thing, you might have noticed that most of day six is just the prosecution doing damage control. It's like they're making excuses for their shoddy case against Mew. But what do I know? The jury obviously did not agree with me. And I may have been on the fence on the first video or two. But the more and more I see of this trial, the harder it becomes to believe that the jury actually convicted him. But anyway, it's been an extremely long week and I need to get started on the next video, which will hopefully close out day six for us and we can move on. And I know it's taken me longer to make these videos now, but it's only because real life is extremely busy at the moment. It won't be this way forever. I'll be back with the rest of day six as soon as possible. I'll see you then. But I tell you what, I don't know about you, but I'm going to go to bed. Thank you. All right, let's get the hell out of here now.